memorial service with my wife and I saw a sea of police uniforms coming to pay their respects to this wonderful young woman. So when we talk about straw purchasing, please don't dismiss it. To many of us, it's very, very important. This framework also recognizes that harms of gun violence go beyond bullet wounds. Gun violence is traumatizing an entire generation of American kids. American kids now fear a shooting could happen in their school any day. And in 27 American schools so far this year, it has. We saw how the mass murder of 19 fourth graders and two teachers at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas, has shattered a community and shaken parents and children from coast to coast. But every shooting, whether it happens in a school in Texas or in a neighborhood in Chicago, leaves ripple effects across the community, for, particularly for the kids who witness it, who endure the loss of a loved one, who live in constant fear they might be the next victim. Often this trauma ends up fueling the cycle of violence. Decades of neuroscience tell us that when kids witness a shooting, it can harm their developing brains and make it harder for kids to form a healthy relationship, regulate emotions, and resolve conflicts. Helping children cope with traumatic experiences is vital to breaking the cycle of violence. That's why I joined with Senator Capito in a bipartisan effort to introduce legislation called the Rise from Trauma Act to deliver services in schools and communities to address trauma. I want to also, at this point, um, make a mention in the record that two weeks ago I was in Chicago and Lurie Children's Hospital uh, hosted a meeting of young people from the neighborhoods with the most gun violence in Chicago. Susan Gordon Hayes is here this morning. I want to thank her and the hospital for their leadership on this issue. We closed the door and this senator sat there and looked at these young people and said, tell me what I don't know about gun violence in your community. They had plenty to tell me. And a lot of it had to do with their life experiences, much different than our own and why they are with where they are today. The framework we're talking about on guns is a step forward. It's a step forward on trauma and mental health programs as well. It could boost programs that bring kids to a better path. Community violence intervention programs, when properly funded and administered, have shown real success in healing trauma. I've said it before and I'll say it again. After every horrific shooting, there is a debate over whether one reform or another could have prevented the last shooting. That misses the point. It's too late to prevent the last shooting. We need to act to prevent the next shooting. When it comes to gun violence in kids, we need to treat this like the public health crisis it is. Study the risk, identify precautions and interventions that work and apply them. We should listen to the doctors and law enforcement leaders whose jobs are, to keep, are there to keep our kids safe. And we should listen to our children when they tell us what they're going through. Today we have a distinguished panel of witnesses and I look forward to their testimony let me turn to my friend and fellow colleague, Senator uh, Grassley of Iowa, for his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like all Americans, uh, I'm heartbroken about the violence that uh, in recent weeks uh, have happened across America, from Uvalde, Texas, to even close to home in Ames, Iowa. Shootings are bringing pain to communities all across our country. The killing of innocent Americans, especially innocent children, is unbearable. It looks like we have a process in place in the Senate where it looks like we're working together to pass legislation that will truly change this situation uh, while protecting constitutional rights. There is so much more that we can do to protect Americans generally, but especially our children. First, uh, school safety should remain a top priority. We must do more to intervene when both children and adults show signs of distress and other concerning behavior. Uh, I know I'm not alone in being sickened to hear again and again that a shooter showed the same predictable signs that were mobilizing towards violence. Uh, we have to intervene. It looks like this framework that uh, we're hearing about is going to try to do that. One vital piece of legislation is the Luke and Alex School Safety Act. This bill was named for two victims, 
of the tragic Parkland school shooting. We're honored to have Alex's father, Max, here with us today to speak about his advocacy on school safety and carrying on the legacy of his son. The bill provides information to schools on how to protect themselves. The bill was recently blocked on the Senate floor by the majority leader, but I'm hoping that we can move it forward very soon. One way that uh, we can help stop violence in schools is to pass the Eagles Act. That uh, name comes from the mascot of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. I wrote this bill after meeting with families who lost loved ones during the Parkland shooting and conducting oversight into the failure of the FBI and local law enforcement to act on credible warnings about the shooter. Thank you, Max, for supporting this bill. Uh, this is a bipartisan bill that would provide funding to support the Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center's efforts uh, to conduct cutting-edge research into the prevention of violence. This bill would also enable that center to train more of our nation's schools in conducting threat assessments and early intervention. Unfortunately, this legislation is stalled during the last two Congresses. I pleaded with my colleagues to help move it forward this year. What happened in Parkland and now in Uvalde should never be allowed to happen again. As I've stated before, it is imperative that we keep firearms out of the hands of those who should not have them. Uh, this can be done through my legislation with Senator Cruz and Tillis, uh, entitled Protecting Communities and Preserving the Second Amendment Act. This legislation would improve the next system by incentivizing and ensuring that relevant records are uploaded in a timely and consistent manner. It would also strengthen criminal penalties for straw purchasing and lying and buying uh, off, uh, offenses. If passed, uh, $20 million per year will be appropriated for five years uh, so that the NICS uh, program can be more effective than it is today. Uh, mental health has taken a toll on Americans across the country, more so in recent years due to COVID-19 lockdowns. Students were forced to stay home and kept out of the classroom and uncertainty about the future overwhelmed both households as well as businesses. Mental health issues are also a root cause of many tragedies that we see across the country. Any legislation proposed in the Senate that is looking to impact change must include resources to address mental health. We can't live in a society where violence is tolerated. In terms of violence and crime, our country has, been, has seen enough. We must uh, take necessary steps uh, to uh, prevent further acts of violence across our country. When it comes to saving children's lives, that means combating gang violence. While mass shootings often receive national attention, there are countless parents who suffer outside of the spotlight of the terrible ramifications of nationwide spike in violent crime. For all of those grieving the premature loss of a child or loved one, I cannot pretend to understand what you're going through. But I'm here to listen, and I want to act. I look forward to discussing policies to keep our children safe. Thanks, Senator Grassley. And I want to just add, I did not see that Senator Cornyn had arrived when I was acknowledging those that are part of this effort to establish a bipartisan gun safety uh, package. Thank you, uh, Senator Cornyn. And I want to acknowledge that Senator Klobuchar has an important element in this package uh, relative to domestic violence. Uh, so as you can see, many members of the committee are actively engaged in this, and we are hoping that we can move forward on it on a timely basis. Today, we welcome five witnesses. I want to thank them for joining us. Before we swear them in, I'll briefly introduce the Democrats, uh, Democratic-sponsored witnesses, and Senator Grassley will introduce the Republicans. The first witness is Ernest Willingham of Chicago, 19 years old, student at Northeastern University in Boston, studying health science. 
Grew up on the west side of Chicago. For those not familiar, that is a very dangerous area when it comes to gun violence. He's the youngest of 11 in his family, the first male in his family to graduate high school, well on his way to a career in the medical field, already worked as a medical assistant and clinical assistant. Ernest, we're glad you're with us. Dr. Mara Salaji, did I get it? Good. Mara Salaji is a pediatrician and professor of pediatrics at UCLA. She's the Division Chief of Development and Behavioral Pediatrics. Currently serves as president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. The AAP is an organization of 67,000 pediatricians dedicated to the health, safety, and well-being of infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. She completed her MD and PhD in pediatric residency at the University of Rochester. Chief Jerry Williams has served since 2016 as the police chief of Phoenix, the largest police agency in the state of Arizona. She currently serves as president of the Major Chiefs Cities Chiefs Association. 32-year law enforcement veteran. Prior to serving as chief in Phoenix, she was chief in the city of Oxnard, California. Bachelor's degree from Arizona State. Master's degree in education from Northern Arizona University. Now I turn to Senator Grassley. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, I introduce uh, Max Schachter. Max is the executive director of State Schools for Alex and father of Alex Schachter, who was tragically murdered Valentine's Day 2018 at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. Max is a national school safety advocate who works for to ensure access to best practices and resources for students, parents, and school districts and law enforcement. We're thankful for your testimony and your passion and your expertise on this subject. Our next witness is Amy Swear. Amy is a legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Edmund Mises III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, where her scholarship focuses on, among other things, the Second Amendment, overcriminalization, uh, school safety, and the intersection of gun violence and mental health. She was a driving force behind the Heritage's School Safety Initiative, which was developed after the tragic 2018 school shooting in Parkland, Florida, uh, to ensure more voices were included in the national conversation on gun control and student safety. Thank you for being here, Amy and Max. Thanks, Senator Grassley. We'll have uh, our opening statements by our witnesses of five minutes and then five minutes of questioning from each senator. And I'll start with the traditional uh, oath. I ask the witnesses to please stand. Raise your right hand. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Mr. Willingham, please proceed with your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and distinguished members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss with you how our nation's youth are in crisis from the persistent gun violence plaguing our country. My name is Ernest Willingham, and I'm a current third year student at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, studying health science with aspirations of becoming a physician. I have seen gun violence up close and personal. Allow me to take you through a journey of what the average young person goes through in a city struggling with gun violence. What it is like to make life decisions when in fear of gun violence or of being shot weighs heavily on your mind every single day. I am the youngest of 11 children. My family lived in the Cabrini Green Housing Projects in Chicago until our building was torn down. We were displaced and lived in Lake County, Illinois for a short time until we moved back to the west side of Chicago where gun violence is raging. I attended Crane Medical Prep High School located on the near west side of Chicago. I have seen my brother, my father, my cousin, and my best friend become victims of gun violence. My brother was shot while we lived in Cambridge Green on two different occasions within a one year time span. Once in the groin and the other time in the leg. I was five years old then. I didn't, have, I didn't have a clear understanding of gun violence, but it did not take a rocket scientist to recognize the emotional trauma. My brother, after being shot for the first time, was vigilant yet fearful. 
Imagine being scared to go out in public or go to family gatherings after being shot in fear of being shot again. On the weekend of August 5th, 2018, my best friend, John A. Patterson, was shot and killed at age 17 by a stray bullet while hanging outside with friends in Chicago. She was one of 66 people shot and one of 12 killed in the city on that very summer weekend. Four years later, in 2022, we still have no closure, no resolution, and her family and so many more are left with unspeakable grief, trauma, and fear. I never understood the anguish from gun violence until I had to sing and provide comfort to Janae's family at the funeral. I was devastated and heartbroken. This is something that young people should never have to prepare themselves for. Yet it remains the lived experience of so many children and youth around our nation. After Janae's life was taken from her and I moved through high school, I dealt with this constant interpersonal fear that I would be shot. And because of this, the trajectory of my career in education was on the line. As I approached my senior year, I was the first male in my family to graduate high school, soon to be college, and I knew that college was the answer. But I was too afraid to stay home and possibly be shot and killed. I purposely did not apply to any schools near my home because I was afraid I was going to die from gun violence. I made a vow to myself that I would rather risk losing my life in another part of the country than have my mother learn that someone had taken my life away from me in Chicago. My mother and I discussed my decision to leave Chicago for college, and we both agreed and made sense, made, made sense that um, it would be best for me to leave given the risk. Growing up in Chicago, it has become the norm to hear that someone, primarily a young person, has been shot and killed. Therefore, we cherish every possible accomplishment because we attended more funerals than weddings. Ask any young person in Chicago, how many weddings have you attended? Very few would have attended one. However, most have attended at least a dozen funerals. I attended an eighth grade graduation this past week with kids ranging from 12 to 14 years of age. As I looked around, I saw parents bawling their eyes out, not just because they were proud, but because they were not burying their children. Gun violence is prevalent everywhere across this country, and it's almost a privilege to say that you haven't been personally affected by it. We know many who have had to bury young children and those who have not yet lived in constant fear that their children will be next. Our young people, the future of our nation, are dying and suffering in mass numbers. For the first 18 years of my life, I was fortunate to have been engaged with the vital program of Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago called Chicago Youth Programs. This program serves youth age 0 to 25, helping them mitigate risk and build strengths via education, comprehensive health care skills development, and career opportunity. It helps youth like me who come from neighborhoods tarnished by poverty. This program altered the course of my life as well as that of a number of my siblings. This summer, I am employed at a school-based health center located in a high school on Chicago's south side. One of my students expressed to me that she was indecisive about going away for college or staying home due to our country's current gun violence climate. Our young people are faced with decisions to which they cannot find answers. Our, young, our youth are terrified, unsafe, and pleading with elected officials in Washington to muster the courage to protect them. Our society, our government, our leaders must protect youth from gun violence. The task is monumental. The statistics on gun and mental health are mind-numbing, sobering, and alarming. For the sake of time, committee members, please refer to my um, written testimony for um, the statistics on gun violence. But there's one I would like to share. In 2017, young black males were 13.7 times more likely to die from a firearm-related homicide than non-black males in Chicago. We have wasted enough time discussing this issue, and now it is a time we pass legislation to stop the killing of innocent persons. We are better than this as a country and we can, solve this we can solve this crisis. Gun violence is a multifaceted issue. We can point the finger at the folks holding the gun. We can blame it on single parent households and we can even blame it on lower income neighborhoods. But until the legislative branch takes a stand to save our children, we are pointing the finger right back at you. Just over the past week, there has been at least 377 deaths and 804 injured from gun violence. Senators, consider yourselves responsible. It is the responsibility of the legislative branch of this government to initiate stricter gun laws and uphold a standard of safety for all people across this country. We cannot continue to allow what Janae Patterson's mother experienced to become the norm for families and fathers across the country. As another day passes without proper steps being taken, the people, the young people of our nation, are holding the legislative branch accountable for each life that is taken away while we wait. 
I plead with you to pass common sense gun legislation so children and youth can grow up in safe communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Willingham. Mr. Schechter. Make sure your mic's on. I bought it. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, members of the Judiciary Committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. And Congressman Ted Deutsch, thank you for being here as well. My name is Max Schachter. In 2008, my wife suddenly passed away in her sleep. As a newly single father of two little boys, I thought that day would be the worst day of my life. Several years later, I met a wonderful woman with two little girls who lost her husband to a heart attack. We fell in love and decided to start a new life in Parkland, Florida. It had been ranked the safest city in our state. On Valentine's Day 2018, I sent my little boy Alex to school, thinking that when I said goodbye to him, he would come home to me. Never for a moment did I think that he would be murdered in his English class. Now Alex is buried next to his mother in the cemetery. After the shooting, I was consumed with grief and anger. After 9-11, we made the airplanes safer. After the Oklahoma City bombing, we made the federal building safer. Yet I could not understand how more than 20 years after Columbine, children and teachers continued to be murdered in their classrooms. I was determined to do everything I could to prevent this from happening again. So my wife and I started a charity called Safe Schools for Alex so that no other family would have to experience our pain. I traveled the country in search of solutions, and what I found was that while some school districts seemed well prepared for acts of gun violence, too many of them had the complacent attitude that Parkland had, that it won't happen here. Administrators and teachers frequently asked me, where do I find these best practices? Where do I begin? Educators are not trained to be school security experts. School officials need proper guidance on what evidence-based practices work and do not, which is why in 2018, I started advocating for the creation of a federal school safety clearinghouse, a streamlined one-stop shop for all school safety best practices, resources, and grant programs. And in 2020, I was ecstatic that this clearinghouse was launched on schoolsafety.gov. SchoolSafety.gov features materials from the Departments of Education, Justice, Homeland Security, and Health and Human Services. The Clearinghouse offers guidance on issues ranging from physical security measures to mental health counseling. It also offers a grant finder tool where school officials can search and apply from more than 40 different programs, offering nearly $2 billion in funding. And the Clearinghouse is already making schools safer. Today, I'm here to ask Congress to pass two important bills to help make schools safer. The first is the Luke and Alex School Safety Act, named in memory of my little boy, Alex, and his good friend, Luke Hoyer. The bill, known as LASA for short, would codify the federal clearinghouse I just described into law. LASA would make the clearinghouse permanent, and it would require the Secretary of Education to actively inform all school districts around the country of the important resources it provides. The second bill is the Eagles Act, named after Alex's high school mascot, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Eagles. The US Secret Service uses threat assessments to protect the president and senior government officials. Law enforcement uses threat assessments to prevent mass shootings. Our children deserve the same protection. The Eagles Act would direct the National Threat Assessment Center of the Secret Service, known as NTAC, to expand their mission to include school safety and provide them the necessary resources that they need to help schools prevent violence before it happens. Since 2000, NTAC has delivered nearly 2,400 training sessions to over 230,000 public and private sector participants on how to conduct threat assessments and prevent targeted violence. I've had the privilege to work alongside NTAC and its chief, Dr. Lena Alathari, and I can tell you that their training has been so effective that schools have almost immediately applied what they have learned to prevent attacks. 
Protecting our kids from gun violence requires us to do everything we can to make schools safer. I'm grateful for the bipartisan support I've received for both Lhasa and Eagles. And now is the time to pass into law the legislation that the Parkland families have been working on for four years. We cannot focus on school safety only when a tragedy happens. School safety must be a year-around priority. By passing Lhasa and Eagles, we can help save lives and prevent the next Uvalde in Parkland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schachter. Dr. Szilagyi is president of the American Academy of Pediatrics and is recognized at this time. Thank you. Chairman Dermott and Ranking Member Grassley, I'm Dr. Morris Szilagyi. I'm a primary care pediatrician and president Could of the you, American Could uh, you pull the microphone a little closer to you? I can. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley, I'm Dr. Moira Szilagyi. I'm a primary care pediatrician and president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. I asked the pediatrician members of the AAP to send me their stories of how gun violence has impacted the children they care for. The response was overwhelming. In just a few days, I received over 300 compelling and heart-wrenching stories from pediatricians. I brought them with me today, and I urge you to read them. On the morning of May 24th, the students of Robb Elementary School started their day like any other. They tied their shoes, put on their backpacks, and said goodbye to their parents. They went to school expecting to see their friends, to learn, and to prepare for summer break. It should have been an ordinary day. But 19 of these children did not return home to their families that day to untie their shoes and hang up their backpacks. These 19, 9, 10, and 11-year-olds, third and fourth grade students, will never return home because their lives were taken in a horrific display of violence. And unfortunately, in America, a day with gun violence has become an ordinary day. Evaldi's only pediatrician, Dr. Roy Guerrero, was called to the emergency room to help with the injured children that day. Ultimately, he lost five of his young patients, children he'd care for for much of their lives. Helping keep children safe is one of the most essential roles of pediatricians like Dr. Guerrero. For example, we work with families to keep children safe in the car by making sure they are safely secured in car seats. We also counsel families on gun safety. But there is only so much pediatricians can do. Keeping children safe is a duty we all collectively share as a society. But in this duty, I am sorry to say, we have failed our children. Gun deaths are preventable, yet every year, 3,500 children and teens die by firearm. Put another way, that is like having a, an Ovalde scale tragedy every other day. And it's not just acts of homicide. Suicide is now the second leading cause of death among youths aged 10 to 24. On behalf of America's pediatricians, I am here today to say we cannot accept this. Senators, you must act. We can't talk about child firearm deaths without talking about trauma. The millions of children who've been exposed to gun violence have experienced trauma. We owe it to our children to protect them because we know from science that childhood trauma and adversity has lifelong impacts on one's health and well-being. Trauma is the obvious result of gun violence, but it's also a root cause of gun violence as well. A recent study of school shootings showed that 100% of school shooters had experienced significant childhood trauma. Trauma begets violence, begets more trauma and violence. We need to identify these traumatized children who are at risk of committing violence, get them into trauma-informed mental health care that they need, and make sure that they cannot access firearms. We will not be successful 100% of the time, but this is a critical element in preventing future tragedies like the one in Ivaldi. We also have to address the availability of firearms for individuals who could do harm. I am really encouraged that a bipartisan group of senators 
have reached a framework agreement to address gun violence. The framework includes new federal investments in mental health, school security, and red flag laws. It also includes meaningful reforms to gun laws, such as improvements in background checks. And we encourage Congress to complete action on this proposal without delay. While this framework is a significant step forward, it's only a start. Safe gun storage is also urgently needed to prevent child suicide, homicide, and accidental death. As a pediatrician who has treated five children who are accidentally shot by themselves or another child after accessing an unsecured loaded gun, I've seen the impacts firsthand. Sadly, two of these children lost their lives. We must do more to encourage gun owners to safely store their firearms. We also need to address the ease of purchasing assault weapons and fill the significant gaps that remain in background checks. And lastly, we call on Congress to increase the federal investment in public health gun violence prevention research. While we know some of what works, we must never stop learning better strategies to keep children safe. Thank you for listening. Our children are counting on you. Thank you, Doctor. Ms. Swear. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and distinguished senators. We're holding this hearing on juvenile gun violence today for one simple reason. The kids are not all right. But the reasons why they're not all right are far more complex than our current national dialogue often admits. Despite some horrific high pro profile mass school shootings in recent years, these are just a fraction of a percent of the problem. And I know, how can I possibly sit here next to a witness who lost a child at Parkland and when we're still burying kids after Uvalde and say that? I don't expect that statistical probabilities make any parent feel the least bit better when mourning the loss of a child. The rarity doesn't lessen their pain or make it any less traumatic, and these shootings devastate communities. But numbers matter when shaping public policy to keep the nation's kids safe. An average of 10 students are killed by gunfire on school property during school hours every year. That's 10 too many. That number should be zero. We can and should make our schools safer. But schools are not where most of our kids are dying. The vast majority of juvenile gun deaths are out of school suicides and homicides, neither of which receives nearly as much attention. And suggesting that the problem is simply guns does everyone a disservice. The problem is deeper. Our kids are suffering from a decades long downward spiral of mental and emotional unwellness, and it's leading them to take their lives at increasing rates, especially since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, over 1,000 high school-aged teens killed themselves with firearms last year. Over 1,000 more killed themselves without a firearm. Our kids are also increasingly uninterested in going to school, with chronic absenteeism rates in major districts this year reaching as high as 40%. This, unsurprisingly, correlates with kids increasingly engaging in serious criminal behaviors that make it more likely they'll victimize others or become victims of gun violence themselves. You can find far more examples in the last school year of teenagers being shot specifically by armed victims while engaging in criminal activity than of teenagers being shot in schools. So what's the federal role in all of this? Because that's the question. That's why we're all here today, right? Well, we know it doesn't work. Banning certain semi-automatic firearms or standard capacity magazines are not serious solutions, and they're based more on irrational fear than on data or on the Constitution. They become even less serious in the context of juvenile deaths, where most of these kids are already unable to lawfully purchase any firearms and are overwhelmingly using or being victimized by criminals with illegally possessed hand, excuse me, handguns. So instead of wasting too much time on what won't save our kids, I'm gonna highlight three solutions out of the many proposed in my written submission, which I hope you read. Number one, allow schools to shift unused COVID funds to uh, school security and mental health. Physical security matters. Swift, armed responses to threats, whether mass shootings or any other threat, matter. Student access to mental health resources matters. They, schools have access right now to over $100 billion in already allocated COVID relief funds. They can and should be able to use it in the short term to hire mental health professionals and invest in physical security needs as a short-term solution, giving them flexibility over the next few years to cut administrative bloat and prioritize long-term spending where it will be most effective. Number two, authorize true behavioral threat assessment research and training. 
Most state and local agencies lack any coherent system for analyzing threats in their own communities. Meanwhile, many federal agencies have decades of training and experience with behavioral threat assessment. Congress can facilitate this process of taking these strategies that we know work at a federal level to prevent uh, targeted mass violence and retooling them in a way that makes sense for state and local entities. Number three, provide healthier, more stable environments for our kids. The root of the problem is not guns. It's the underlying causes that create violent environments in the first place. Parents, and especially low-income and working parents, need more choices when it comes to accessing mental health care for their kids. They also need more choices when it comes to adequate learning environments. Studies and statistics clearly show that when parents can more easily remove their kids from schools where they are bullied, face violent threats, or are not otherwise receiving necessary resources, it alleviates the risk of suicide and the likelihood that they will participate in criminal behaviors that are most associated with violent outcomes, like gun-related death and injury. Kids deserve educational environments where they feel safe and are most likely to develop, to develop into thriving adults, regardless of income or zip code. Senators, it's clear that the kids are not all right. They're increasingly suicidal. They're increasingly engaging in serious criminal behaviors. They're increasingly deciding that school just isn't worth it, and we are watching as their futures and their lives vanish. We are losing our kids. And if we don't act soon and act to stem these problems at the source, it won't just be the kids that we're losing. We will lose an entire generation of adults as well. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Swear. Chief Williams. Uh, good morning, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. Yesterday in Phoenix, the ninth of one of my officers was shot in the line of duty. Had it not been for her vest that she is wearing, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I would be in Phoenix planning for another funeral. I appear before you today as a police chief in Phoenix, Arizona. I also serve as a president of the Major City Chiefs Association. It is my honor to testify on behalf of my MCCA colleagues. Nearly every major city in the United States is grappling with rising gun violence. The nature of many of these shootings is extremely troubling. These incidents often involve multiple victims and trigger pullers. For example, in Phoenix again a few weeks ago, a shooting in Phoenix killed one and injured eight. The increase in gun violence is having a significant impact on America's youth, as previously mentioned. The number of juveniles killed and injured by gun violence has increased sharply over the past few years. However, that impact also goes well beyond the victims. Sadly, many MCCA members have reported an increase in the amount of gun violence perpetrated by juveniles. This has created a vicious cycle because today's suspects is often tomorrow's victim. It's incredibly troubling to see such a disregard for the sanctity of life at a young age. Youth in major cities, especially communities of color, have become desensitized to the persistent gun violence in their communities. Children should neither be afraid of getting hit by a stray bullet in their homes, attending an event, or walking through their neighborhood, nor should any child feel the need to carry a gun to protect themselves or think that using it is an appropriate way to resolve conflict. Reducing juvenile gun violence will require addressing the trauma inflicted when children witness violence or become victims of violence themselves. Our MCCA member cities have made significant investments in intervention programs that are aimed to help the juveniles heal, prevent retaliation, and then break the cycles of violence described above. However, as previously mentioned, this is only part of the solution. Guns have flooded our communities and it's become far too easy for our children to get their hands on a gun. The MCCA has long been an advocate for sensible firearms policy. In fact, in 2018, the MCCA adopted a firearms violence policy that would help mitigate the threat of gun violence without infringing on constitutional rights or weakening due process. These reforms include requiring universal background checks, closing the boyfriend loophole, supporting the use of extreme protection orders, aggressively prosecuting straw purchases and prohibited possessors, and lastly, banning assault weapons and high capacity magazines. The MCCA was greatly encouraged by the bipartisan firearms policy framework that was recently released. There is significant, significant overlap with the MCCA firearms policy and polling shows that the majority of Americans support common sense reform. And Congress must act immediately to close those loopholes and the gaps in our system. 
As was previously mentioned, protecting our children also requires addressing the underlying violent crime problem in many of our cities. Unfortunately, constitutional proactive policing that helps drive violent crime down has sometimes become a luxury for many departments. Law enforcement needs additional resources to bolster its response to violent crime and gun violence. An overall lack of accountability for violent offenders is contributing to the rise in gun violence. In some of our major cities, district attorneys are not prosecuting serial firearm offenders. Judges continue to release violent offenders on low or no bond. To address these challenges, Congress must provide resources to the U.S. Attorney's offices to support additional federal prosecution as appropriate. Additionally, we know that approximately 60% of the districts do not have a Senate-confirmed U.S. Attorney. A confirmed U.S. Attorney is a key partner in local law enforcement's fight against violent crime. Local law enforcement continues to do everything in our power to protect our communities from gun violence, and unfortunately, the brave officers on the front line, as the one that I mentioned previously, have not been spared. In the last six months, nine Phoenix police officers have been shot and 15 injured. Many of these attacks are brazen and the shooters are often violent offenders with previous felony conviction. The violence against law enforcement must stop. The current gun violence epidemic has been particularly devastating to America's youths. Far too many children have needlessly lost their lives and countless others have been traumatized. These children are our future and we must do everything in our power to protect them from the threat of gun violence. The Major City Chiefs Association stands ready to work with you to achieve this goal. Thank you again for this opportunity and I look forward to any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Chief. And now each member will have five minutes to ask questions. I wanna start with you if you don't mind, Chief Williams. Yes. Thank you. In the Buffalo situation at the supermarket, there was a retired policeman who was a security guard. Yes, sir. And when the shooter came in with his AR-15 and started shooting randomly the customers in the store, he pulled out his handgun and he was gunned down by this AR-15 as well. Yes, he was clearly outgunned uh, at that scene. That is not an uncommon experience that many of the police that we count on around this country are being outgunned by the shooters. Is there a response that you would think could make it safer for the police that you represent? So thank you, Chairman Durbin, for that question. Uh, we are outgunned. We're outgunned, we're outmanned, we're outstaffed. Um, we do need responsible gun legislation. We do believe that there should be a ban on assault weapons and high capacity magazines in order for us to properly serve our and protect our community. Dr. Uh, Salaji, you heard Mr. Willingham tell the story of growing up in Chicago and what he's been through and what he's witnessed and what he hears from his friends. Can you tell me a little bit, I think that would fit into the adverse childhood experience for sure, the trauma situation. Can you tell me, it, I'm trying to look for a hopeful sign here. He's come forward and made, has made quite a great uh, contribution in his own life toward his college education and his aspirations. What are the hopes of rescuing young people like him who have been exposed to this trauma as they're growing up? Thank you so much for that question, Senator Durbin. And I really like to thank Ernest Willingham for his testimony. He represents so many of the youth that I take care of. I've, I've been a foster care um, child welfare pediatrician for over 30 years. And one can't do that work without seeing trauma every day, everywhere I look. Um, I do think there's been a pervasive sense of hopelessness um, among our youth, and that's partly why we're seeing such an increase in youth suicide and youth violence. But you asked about adverse childhood experiences and childhood trauma. And so the studies were done a long time ago now, but they have continued and they've reinforced what we know, that children who have high level, levels of exposure to adversity, particularly intrafamilial adversity, or stressors outside the family, such as discrimination, bullying, and community violence, have high rates of lifelong mental health, health, and, and poor social outcomes. But we also know that young people who grow up in such environments can also do well, but they do well because they have a lot of resources poured into them. So the hopeful part 
are the families, having a good family, as it sounds like Mr. Willingham um, really had, um, finding teachers and educators who support you. I actually grew up in a rough and tough neighborhood, and I was blessed to have a wonderful family. And um, several of my friends died by suicide while I was growing up, and um, I also had um, a friend of my brother's was shot in my home by his cousin. So I've seen violence in my personal life. The hope comes that we know what we need to do to fix things. Um, and in particular about adverse childhood experiences, it is identifying these children early. It is pouring resources um, into them, and a lot of that has to do with the relationships we, we surround them with. We need evidence-based trauma-informed mental health care, and I deeply appreciate the work that you have been doing to pass legislation on um, increasing mental health supports and addressing trauma-informed care. Um, and I do think that there is hope. I have certainly seen the young people I know in foster care. I, they have ranged from kids saying to me, I don't expect to live past 20. Many of them probably grew up in neighborhoods similar to Mr. Willingham's. Um, but I've also seen the young people from similar circumstances with the right inputs do very, very well, like Mr. Willingham going on to college and planning their future. So yes, there is hope. Thank, Thank you, you, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Willingham, I, I wish I had more time because I'd, I'd like for you to explain with all your friends and yourself going through a lifetime exposed to this gun violence and uncertainty and um, despair in some situations how you ended up weathering that storm and are moving in the right direction. Could you say it in a few words? I'm sorry and I don't have more time. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, for that question. Um, it's as simple as stating, as Dr. Moore explained, having a village, it takes really a village to pour into one child. Um, and having a team of people, a good family, um, teachers, mentors, all of those different things matter. Um, there are, and I'm not the only one in my neighborhood doing great things. I'm not the only young person in Chicago that has excelled throughout um, difficult times in their lives. But the reason so many of us have been able to excel in the midst of um, controversy in the midst of gun violence, in the midst of just a difficult upbringing is because of the village, because where you have a village to um, help you navigate through high school, help you navigate through college and possible career things, and also just that social and emotional um, counseling and therapy that you get, and not necessarily from a mental health professional, from someone, a community health worker or um, an educator in the school or someone at your neighborhood corner store. It, it literally takes a village to um, really navigate a child through difficult circumstances. I've so heard, that's what I can attest to my story. I've heard that phrase before. Thank you very much, Mr. Willingham. Senator Grassley. Uh, Max, you've dedicated your life to enhancing safety in schools. I think you've advocated increasing physical security, introducing threat assessment programs, advocating for school resource, resource officers. These programs all serve to deter mass shootings in schools. One of the things that you've advocated is patient and very passionately for is dissemination of best practices and school safeties. I'm proud to co-sponsor a bill named after your son that will codify Federal Clearinghouse of Best Practices. How did you come to the conclusion that this vital element of protecting children in schools is an important approach? Thank you, Senator Grassley. After Alex was murdered in the Parkland school shooting, I made it my mission to do everything I could to make sure that this never happened again. And when I traveled the country, the question that I got from a lot of educators were, where are these best practices? And what they were getting was a lot of confusing material from a lot of the different federal agencies. So we had this idea to create a federal school safety clearinghouse and it's really uh, been a model for what the federal government can do if they all work together. 
and all of the ed agencies that work on school safety. So you've got the Department of Education, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Justice, and the Department of Department of Homeland Security are now all working together. They're coordinating, they're cooperating, and they're um, they have an editorial board. So they've they've. They've gone through this issue and everything, all the best practices that schools need are all housed on schoolsafety.gov because as I traveled the country, there's a lot of schools that were doing great things, but the problem was that a lot of schools didn't know that and it was really only contained to the vicinity around that particular area. And so schools need help. Uh, most educators become educators uh, because they, they want to teach and they want to help children, not because they want to be school security experts. There's only, uh, there's only one program that I know of that, that is the most uh, successful uh, that teaches teachers about school safety in college, and that is at the Indian River State College in Florida. They're doing, they're doing great things. I think it's really important that teachers are taught that in, in college before they become teachers so that the burden is, is not on the school district as well. So this clearinghouse that is formed is, do, is, doing, uh, is doing wonderful things. Not only do they have a place to have best practices, they also have a consolidated place for grant dollars. So on the site, school districts have a, can go on their new grant finder tool. There's 40 different programs available and over $2 billion. So I encourage all educators and parents, uh, parents want information about how to make their schools safe and that information is all available on schoolsafety.gov. And schools that are curious about what they should do first and where their gaps are, they have a school readiness tool where all they do is they fill out a 10 question uh, questionnaire on the site and that'll tell, them, based on their answers, that'll tell them where, what they should be doing first, what they should be doing second, where their gaps are in school safety, and then Based on their gaps, it directs them to grant dollars. So I really hope that this Congress um, will pass the Luke and Alex School Safety Act, and that is included in the new bipartisan agreement on, on gun safety. This will have to be my last question to Max and to Amy. Uh, the Threat Assessment Center data shows over 80% of the active shooter events lasting less than five minutes. So would both of you tell me what role do school resource officers serve in mitigating firearm violence in schools? Let's start with Amy. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we know that when we've reached the point where it's too late, where we're not talking about prevention, we are talking about an individual who is an active threat to that school, whether because they're a mass shooter or any other threat. Um, and in that moment, what matters is how quickly there is an armed response, an armed confrontation. School resource officers play a role in that armed confrontation because they are the ones on scene. It lessens that amount of time. Um, and you actually saw this in Santa Fe High School uh, several weeks after Parkland, um, where within uh, under four minutes, you had school resource officers draw that shooter's attention to themselves, heroically take on that gunfire, um, and we would have seen, but for that, a rate of death uh, quite similar to Parkland, but instead it was, it was far less. Um, and we've seen this, I've, I've listed in my written testimony, a number of other occasions where school resource officers have been immediately on the scene to confront that threat, again, whether it's a mass shooting or any other threat, um, because we know that that is the, in that moment, the thing that matters most is the, the quickness of that response. Mac, maybe you can give a, sh a short response so I don't take time from my colleagues. In Parkland, in just three minutes and 51 seconds, 24 people were shot and or killed, including my little boy, Alex. And school resource officers are, are critical to being on scene. In Florida, we are the only state in the country that we've mandated that every K through 12 school, there has to be an armed security officer. When, when these incidents happen, the most important thing is that they stop the killing and then stop the dying. And 
I just, I just wish, wish they were sooner. Um, but you know, all the other thing that needs to be addressed is, is the law enforcement response in Parkland. We had nine uh, sheriff's office deputies that waited outside. We saw the same thing in Uvalde. Law enforcement needs to do better at the training. Uh, when, when the Broward Sheriff's Office was only training, conducting active shooter training every three years, that is not sufficient. And we saw the result. Thank you. Thank you. We're calling on the Democratic side based on the early bird rule. And next up is Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to use my time, if I may, to make a statement. This country is no stranger to the horror of gun violence and its impact on our nation's children. Just last month in Texas, 19 children and two teachers were killed by a teenager with an assault weapon. Only 10 days before that, 10 people were killed at a grocery store in Buffalo by a teenager with an assault weapon. I think we deserve better than this. And I've reintroduced the Age 21 Act. This bill would prohibit the sale of assault weapons and high capacity magazines to anyone under the age of 21. If this bill had been law, it would have prevented the teenagers in both Buffalo and Uvalde from legally purchasing the weapons they later used to kill a combined 31 people, including 19 children. I really deeply believe, I've been on this committee for a long time, that we need common sense reforms like the Age 21 Act to protect our children. Since 2018, six of the nine deadliest shootings in the United States were committed by someone under the age of 21. That's a fact. The bill has received significant support from both medical professionals and educators because it would be a big step toward protecting, pr protecting children from gun violence. The National Association of School Psychologists, the American School Counselor Association, and the American Federation of Teachers recently sent letters to the Senate in support of the bill. So, Dr. Sislagi and Chief Williams, can you discuss what you have seen in your work between young people having easy access to dangerous firearms and harms caused to children from gun violence? So, Senator, thank you for that question. Um, as I previously mentioned in my oral statement, today's victims is tomorrow's suspects. We're seeing kids as young as 12, 13, and 14 have accessibility to guns and are unafraid to use those weapons in order to hurt or harm individuals in the community. So your point is extremely well taken when we talk about the age and the accessibility to weapons. We as a country need to do better and our children deserve far much better from us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. <clears throat> After the shooting in Uvalde, like Buffalo, like Florida, like in Colorado, every time one of these shootings occurs, we hear people say, do something. Do something. Unfortunately, there are also people who say, do nothing. And I, for one, am not going to be part of that cause as long as parents fear for the safety of their children in their schoolroom and children fear being in the classroom. I firmly believe there are things that we can do that do not infringe the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens. I don't think we're talking about law-abiding citizens committing mass shootings or committing crimes we're talking about criminals, we're talking about people with mental health crises, and then we're talking about other things we need to do to harden our schools, to use best practices, and provide resources for our mental health 
treatment at the community level. I think our community, our uh, mental health delivery system in America is a scandal. And we have a plan. Senator Stabenow, Senator Blunt have a great piece of legislation we hope to be able to pass as soon as next week that would provide massive investment in community-based mental health care. So police have some place to take someone suffering a mental health crisis other than the jail. People suffering mental health crisis have somewhere to go other than the emergency room. And we can actually get people some help so they don't get sicker and sicker and sicker and become a threat to themselves and potentially to others. I'm not suggesting that people undergoing mental health crises are always violent. That's not true. But some are. And as the doctor said, 60%, I don't know if you put a number on it, but you pointed out that 60% of the suicide deaths in America today are using a gun. So we, I think, have some things that we can do. And we need to do what we can. But what I would like to ask, um, maybe Ms. Swearer, start with, it sounds like we're conflating a lot of different sorts of scenarios. The shootings in Chicago, which occur on a very frequent basis. Um, you know, Chicago, Illinois has the toughest gun laws in America, but that arguably will not deter a gang member or a criminal. Um, so can you sort of help us cut through this and, um, you know, we're, my, my hope is we'll focus on s solving problems as opposed to making an ideological statement. But uh, can you help us cut through that? Sure, Senator, your, your point is well taken that gun violence is much more complicated than any you know, one specific subset of, of gun violence. And in fact, it is important to sort of separate those out because different types of gun violence have different uh, underlying causes. They have different appropriate means of addressing them. Um, they're e even including from the standpoint of, quote, you know, gun control. Um, for example, when you're talking about gun violence uh, in more, you know, urban, area, urban areas, gang-centric violence, it tends to be individuals who have long rap sheets or already prohibited prohibited persons who are illegally possessing firearms. And that's a lot different from, say, suicides, which are two-thirds of gun deaths, where you're, obviously there is a mental health component there, or mass shooters um, who are almost always showing signs of being dangerous but are legally possessing their guns. Um, so it's important to sort those things out and to treat them individually in the way that they need to be treated. Thank, uh, th thank you for that. I, unfortunately, I got 30 seconds, and I want to ask the doctor a question. So the profile of some of these young uh, male shooters is, um, seems eerily, eerily similar in some cases. You look at Adam Lanz at Sandy Hook, you look at Salvador Ramos in uh, Uvalde, Texas, and the New York Times, I think, did a good job pointing out that like in six, of nine, six out of nine of the mass shootings, the profile is pretty familiar. If we were able to get community-based mental health assistance to the, to the young men, young boys really, and their families earlier, do you think we could improve the outcomes for them so that they could maybe live productive lives and not sort of circle down the drain and out of despair kill themselves and others as well? My brief answer is yes. <laughs> Amy's helping me out, thank you. Um, it, my brief answer is yes, and I think that we probably need to make sure that everybody who interacts with a youth, whether that's an educator, a pediatrician, a police officer, is versed in trauma-informed care, and that type of training is available and goes on around the country. It is evidence-based, and I think if we could um, have every professional who interacts with a child take that kind of approach that yes, um, and increasing our access to mental health services through community-based mental health, school-based mental health, integrated care in primary care settings, I think is crucial and it all needs to be funded. So thank you so much for your thank work you. on this. Thanks, Senator Cornyn, Senator Whitehouse. 
Thank you, Chairman, and thanks to uh, everyone for being here. I want to um, begin by uh, remarking on the action that my home state has uh, just taken, our Rhode Island General Assembly, as it's preparing to pass the final big budget bill that is the conclusion of the legislative year, um, has just uh, banned large capacity magazines has just raised the age to 21 to buy firearms or ammunition, and has just banned open carry of loaded rifles and shotguns, which seem like pretty reasonable interventions. I believe they're actually gun clubs with ranges where the range safety officer won't let you use a large capacity magazine, so that seems like a pretty reasonable accommodation. Um, we don't allow people under 21 to buy a beer, so why they need to buy firearms and ammunition is a little hard to explain, particularly uh, in the wake of what we've seen recently. And um, for the life of me, I can't imagine, as a gun owner myself, why you need to open carry a loaded long gun around uh, in this uh, society. So. Um, I think we're seeing some signs of progress at the state level. Um, I wanted uh, to ask um, Chief Williams. I've spent a lot of years as a prosecutor involved with domestic violence. And one of the things we learned in the domestic violence context is the impact on young people simply of being a witness to domestic violence in the home. I see you nodding. Uh, we've learned a lot about that. Um, our domestic violence community has developed, I think, very good interventions for that. Could you tell me what you think the lessons are uh, that we learned in the domestic violence context from children who are witness to violence uh, domestic violence at home for the children who are witness to even more ghastly demonstrations of violence in their schools with these massacres in which the damage to their classmates and friends is so great that DNA is required to identify the remains. So, Senator, thank you for that question. Um, as we all know, domestic violence plays a, a role in everything that we all do, from local law enforcement to what you all do here. Um, children seeing trauma, children normalizing trauma, children witnessing trauma, I'm sure the doctor would, would say this also, creates this vicious cycle of violence where that child go to her next. That, that's, that is the, the norm. Um, and so we as a society owe it to them to, as was previously mentioned, providing those services to those kids early and quickly and consistently. I mean, it shouldn't be a one-stop shop where you go in for care and then all of a sudden you're healed because that doesn't happen. Uh, as far as the violence in school, we know that violence happens in school. It's obvious, it's evident. We need to provide those resources from a trauma-informed standpoint also to the students as well as the parents as well as the educators. Thank you for the question. And doctor, I wanted to go to you with the same question. You obviously in emergency rooms see the children who are brought in whose bodies have been torn apart by uh, these weapons and the ammunition that they discharge. Um, but that leaves all of their classmates who were not physically injured. Uh, what are your recommendations and advice to this committee regarding what sort of um, impact what they have witnessed has on the classmates who were not physically injured? and what we need to do to provide supports for those kids and for their families. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that question, Senator Whitehouse. Um, we know the impact of trauma on the brain of any kind, some worse than others. And we know after children have witnessed horrific events like shootings or other horrific events that they live with on a day-by-day -day basis like interpersonal violence, that the back part of the brain, the limbic system, goes on hyper alert and kind of trains the brain to always scan for danger. They become hyper vigilant. They become very frightened. They sometimes 
erupt very quickly because the front part of the brain, which helps us to make judgment and rational decisions, is um, less well-functioning um, after trauma. We also know that there are ways to help children, and there are numerous evidence-based trauma-informed mental health interventions that we can use to support families in supporting their children and providing therapy to children. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Booker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, <coughs> Dr. Stilogy, I, I thank you for your commentary. I think um, Mr. Willingham and I could probably appreciate what it's like to live in a community where you hear gunfire. Um, Mr. Willingham, I know you have the feeling like I do when you know young people who've died. I've lost young men that I've mentored. I've watched kids that I've watched grow up. And I'm tired of seeing sidewalk shrines with teddy bears and candles all around my neighborhood. And to the Senator Whitehouse's point, it really is the horror of a family losing a child, but the entire community suffers. Uh, Chief, I know you know this, when in communities like mine, when it's 4th of July is coming up, and I know what will happen when fireworks go off. Parents will tell me stories about their kids hiding under beds, calling the police, hiding in closets, and you see what that constant cortisol pumping in the brain does to their development, to their interactions with others. We had a kid bring a gun to school in my city just last week, not because he was seeking to hurt anybody, because he thought he needed it for protection. I, I have uh, been championing a bill for a long time. It got included in the um, Build Back Better program uh, called Break the Cycle of Violence Act, and it's for uh, community violence intervention. I'm hoping it makes it into this bipartisan compromise some resources. Uh, I really appreciated the testimony of Ms. Swearer, Swearer, who we should follow the evidence, follow what works. Well, the data from places like Oakland um, are are amazing with how much we can drop violence. Uh, and for instance, funding for hospital-based violence intervention programs that provide intensive counseling, peer support, case management, mediation, social services make a difference. And so I was wondering if, if you could affirm that. It's not, uh, again, we talk about the guns, which I wanna talk about, but we know that for the mental health, for the well-being uh, for communities that are grappling with this, there are other approaches that show massive reductions in violence. Thank you for that question, Senator Booker. I, um, I, I think that they all have a common thread running through them. Yes, there are evidence-based interventions that have shown tremendous success. And I think the common thread comes out of the science of resilience where we know the, 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 when the brain gets flooded by a hormone called oxytocin, when there's a positive relationship in a child's life or a positive support group, that that activates the, the relationship or the affiliation network of the brain. And that, that is as much a real network as the trauma network, if we want to think about it that way. And I think, you know, it gives us great cause for optimism um, that we have these various interventions that we can ha have been proven in science that are probably working through that network and that can really help the child's brain develop in a way um, that leads them toward becoming the kind of person Mr. Willingham and yourself have become even though you've grown up in neighborhoods that um, people may have lowered their expectations for. Yeah, your I, I, what fear does to a community, not to mention the economic impact. I remember we had a shooting at a IHOP they canceled their night shift. It, uh, people lost jobs. It is a horrific thing that it does to our communities. Um, Ms. Swearer, I think you'd be surprised at how much we probably agree on uh, from policy-wise. Um, I, uh, I agreed with you. You mentioned schools. It's great in my community that parents have high-quality choices from public charter schools to magnet schools to you name it. Um, and I agree with you about focusing on violence. Uh, these assault weapons, which I would like to see bans on, they are a very small percentage of the, of the, of the killings. Uh, the, the Shahad, a young man I saw grow up, got killed at the top of my block with an assault weapon, and the, the officer told me it was like their head exploded. So I'm concerned about those weapons. But I agree with you about following 
the policy interventions that are going to yield us the biggest reduction in violence. But there's one question I, I have to ask, and, and I stipulate that I'm in agreement with a lot of your testimony, but I don't understand when I hear the arguments uh, from friends of mine, colleagues of mine, that, that don't think it's the guns because England has the same mental health problems. The same, I, I lived there for two years, horrible suicide rates with the kids. Canada as well, but people don't die of gun violence, so it has to be the guns to some point, the easy access to guns, and I agree with you. In my time as mayor of Newark, law-abiding gun owners were not committing the crimes. It was people getting access, easy access to guns. So to, to have a picture that paints not a call to do something in this country about the guns seems to be a, a little incomplete. W would you agree? Uh, to an extent, I, I would agree. It's about doing something about the, the guns that are actually causing problems in the hands of people who are committing violent offenses. And I think we'd agree overwhelmingly it's, it's not about broad measures in the hands of, of law-abiding citizens, um, which is why it is important to do things like combat you know, the, the very large and robust black market for firearms that we have in this country. Um, and I, I, pretty, I, I actually do agree, Senator, that there is a lot that you and I do agree on. Um, it, and it's not that it's not about firearms. I would also point out we have a, a pretty significant problem with non-firearm homicide in this country, too, which is why it's important to address I, I've got to be respectful of my colleagues. I'm way over my time. The one thing I'll say is I look at the data. When Wyoming got rid of their gun licensing, shootings went up 20 percent, suicides rose. When Connecticut put gun licensing in, the data shows 40 percent drop in shootings, 15 percent drops in suicides. And so to me, I want to follow the data. And the ease of access to guns, a gun in the house, even a law-abiding citizen, with ha just having a gun in the house, increases the likelihood that their children will commit suicide with it dramatically. And so I'm all for following the data, but we've got to c admit the, the, the facts and the data that we have it points to a lot of the solutions that are being called for on both sides of the aisle, but it also points to doing something about the ease of access to guns. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. Senator Lee? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. His recent attacks on students at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, uh, as well as patrons at the Topps Grocery Store in Buffalo, New York, and Christmas parade attendees in Waukesha, Wisconsin, and students and teachers at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, are unthinkable tragedies. In the aftermath of each of these tragedies, we go through a number of processes. We, we mourn. Uh, we cry, we pray, we express our condolences for those who have lost loved ones. We attempt to assess what went wrong and to fix any failures of policy or oversights by law enforcement or society that might have allowed these heart-wrenching, uh, gut-churning tragedies to occur. Unfortunately, uh, politics often gets in the way. Uh, uh, every time a tragedy like this occurs, there are a number who immediately demand the same gun control pros proposals that uh, many have pushed for decades while simultaneously attempting to defund police in schools. But the people who will be hurt by these proposals are not the criminals. They are the law-abiding gun owners and children in unsafe schools. During the Obama administration, the Department of Justice studied how criminals convicted of gun crimes obtained firearms, more than half uh, the precise number was 56 percent, had obtained the weapon illegally. To really address this rise of violent behavior, we need to look at what's causing males in our society to become so angry, isolated, socially detached, that they'll commit these uns unspeakable, unthinkable horrors. We need to look not just at what caused the tragic school shootings like Uvalde and Parkland, but also what's causing the massive increases in violent crime in large cities across our country, including our nation's capital in cities like San Francisco and Chicago. If we take a look at it, I think that we might find that there are contributing factors that include both cultural issues and policy issues. The cultural issues might include, among other things, uh, broken families, bullying, glorification and obsession with, with violence in news and entertainment media, obsession with social media and loss of community connection. 
The policy issues might include things like the anti-bail policies of woke prosecutors, COVID lockdowns, failure to enforce our laws, and school policies instructing teachers and administrators to look the other way when students display disturbing and potentially violent behavior. Mr. Schachter, I'd like to start with you, if, if that's okay. My, first of all, my, my deepest condolences go out to you uh, uh, in connection with your, the loss of your son, Alex. I applaud your efforts to make our schools safer, and I, I support the Luke and Alex Safe Schools Act, uh, which is something that thank you. has been proposed in response to your great work, so thank you for that. Now, following the, the shooting um, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, we found that the shooter displayed incredibly troubling and violent behavior. And yet, notwithstanding that behavior, which had been observed by a number of people familiar with him, um, we found that he, instead of being reported to authorities and removed from the school or otherwise put in, in some type of uh, a program that might have led to a different outcome, Broward County school officials hid the behavior from law enforcement, didn't report it, hid it, brushed it under the rug. Why would schools hide? Why would they go to such lengths to hide violent behavior? I don't quite understand this. Why, why wouldn't they just report this troubled, violent individual to law enforcement or otherwise take action? Thank you, Senator. There's a lot of, a lot of issues that, that you talked about there, but I think that the, the solution to, to doing, to you know, connecting all these dots, I mean, number one, you had a massive problem. There were silos of information. You know, the, the Parkland murderer was extremely violent. He committed over 55 different disciplinary incidents in school, and then law enforcement was at his house over 40 times. Law enforcement didn't know what was happening in the school. The school didn't know what was happening outside of the school. So it's really connecting those dots. And that's why Senator Grassley's bill is so critical, Eagles Act. Because Eagles Act reauthorizes the U.S. Secret Service's National Threat Assessment Center, which are the ones that are doing this work of connecting the dots through the behavioral threat assessment. And if the behavioral threat assessments are done correctly, you've got a lot of, of great outcomes. A couple of them are, number one, reduced suspensions, exclusionary discipline, bullying, racial disparities, and school arrests, which is what we all want. But even more importantly, if you're doing these threat assessments done, done correctly and properly with fidelity, which did not happen in Parkland, uh, Parkland did a threat assessment on the Parkland murderer in 2016, completely botched it. The assistant principal that did the threat assessment had never done one in his 30-year career, didn't know where the paperwork was, didn't know how to fill it out. And I think that, you know, we're seeing the same things in, in Oxford High School, and I think we're going to see a lot of, uh, in all of these horrible tragedies, because we know these individuals don't just snap overnight. They exhibit concerning behavior ahead of time, and that's why, uh, you know, if we can pass the Eagles Act, that will reauthorize the Secret Service's National Threat Assessment Center to do what they're doing and pass and teach more school districts to do threat assessments properly. Because if we can do that, we can stop mass shootings in schools, but not only that, the goal of a threat assessment is to get these, these individuals the help they need. And if we can do that, we can make them productive members of society and make our entire country safer in the long run. Thank you. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Lee. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join you in thanking our colleagues on the committee uh, who have uh, worked on this framework. Um, I also want to especially thank um, Mr. Willingham and you, Mr. Schachter, uh, for having the courage to come forward um, and um, believing that you can save other lives, other kids' lives, um, um, after the tragedies that you've experienced. Um, um, and Mr. Schachter, last, after Parkland Center, Hatch and I uh, led the effort for some funding. It was like $100 million. It wasn't enough, but it was significant for schools, and that, some of that is still uh, going out there. 
um, to the schools and more needs to be done. I want to focus on part of the framework here, which does interact, as Senator Booker has pointed out, with kids, uh, and that is the closing of the boyfriend uh, loophole. Every year, more than 600 American women are shot to death by intimate partners. Uh, that's one woman shot to death every 14 hours. So I want you to picture that number, 600 every single year. And uh, we know for a fact by looking at the numbers that preventing domestic abusers from buying a gun uh, helps to save lives. These are convicted domestic abusers. Uh, currently, federal law only prohibits domestic abusers from buying a gun if they are formerly married or currently married or live together or have a child. And I know you know this, Chief, um, uh, but half of the women killed by intimate partners are dating partners, romantic partners. They don't fit into those nice little categories uh, set out in the law. That's why 19 states, uh, including my state, have taken the common sense action to close uh, the boyfriend loophole. Senator Grassley at one point had a hearing on this. Even the most conservative witnesses were in favor of this piece of our bill. Uh, in the states that have closed the loophole, we've seen a 13% reduction in intimate partner homicides involving firearms. So this is one thing. It's clearly not the only thing, as all you know um, uh, from the losses you've seen. Uh, but this bill was introduced. I led it in 2013. Been leading it ever since. That's a long time. Um, I want to thank Senator Hirono for joining me in the bill. And also, uh, a few years later, Congresswoman Dingell uh, introduced a companion to it. So uh, I want to ask about the ways, first of all, that this affects kids. The first is obvious. Oftentimes when domestic abusers will shoot uh, their uh, partner, um, kids are also killed in the crossfire or injured in the crossfire with the chief is nodding her head. The second way, of course, is um, just the impact it has on their lives growing up in such a home. Um, when I was Hennepin County attorney, uh, I actually had a picture right outside my door. It was a poster of a woman beaten up with a Band-Aid over her nose holding a little baby in her arms, and the words read, beat your wife, and it's your son that goes to jail, uh, just to make that point, uh, because so many of the kids that grow up in those homes uh, end up um, getting involved in crime or domestic abuse themselves. Um, you noted, uh, Dr. Salagi, in your uh, written testimony that oftentimes childhood trauma is a root of later acts of violence. He just talked about how closing this loophole would help. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar, for that question. Um, it, it would really help, I think, if we could identify children and families at risk early. And, and this is really incumbent upon us as pediatricians because we meet families early. But it's also incumbent on anybody who works with children and families. I think if we can get the right supports in place for children early, there is evidence showing that we can improve um, the sense of safety in the home. We can decrease the violence in the home, um, removing the person who is being violent is certainly one very uh, important way to do that. But we can um, use the parent-child relationship to rebuild the child's sense of safety and decrease the impact of trauma on the brain. And it moves the child out of their fight and flight brain into their learning and thinking brain. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one last question, Chief Williams. Um, um, I remember one of our police officers in Lake City, Minnesota, who um, went to a domestic violence scene, had on his bulletproof vest um, by a very, very severely mentally ill uh, young man who was abusing his girlfriend who was very young. Um, he just shot him in the head when he came to the door. The officer was at the funeral. Three little kids, a little girl with a blue dress with stars all over it, walking down the aisle of the church where only three weeks ago that proud dad who was now dead had sat in the front row um, watching his kids in the nativity play. Um, something you don't forget. Could you quickly talk about some of the dangers that law enforcement officers face when responding to a domestic violence call and how those dangers are amplified when an abuser is armed? So thank you very much for that question, Senator. I can give you a practical example that actually happened in Phoenix. Um, very clearly, a boyfriend shot and killed his girlfriend inside and then lured Phoenix police officers to the door, shot five, injured four others, one of the largest scale events that we've had because of a domestic violence incident. 
This is troubling, it's real, and it's impacting not just the children in our community, but our officers are being traumatized, impacted, and shot as well. Well, thank you. I didn't know about that story, but I think you see similar stories across the country, and it just shows that there is not just one victim in domestic abuse. There's the family surrounding uh, that victim, and then there's the entire community, including police officers. So thank you, and I'm just um, really um, thankful uh, that um, we are, it looks like we are finally advancing this bill, and I think it's going to make a big difference in these types of cases. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin. Um, and I'd like to thank my colleague, Senator Klobuchar, for her uh, long work on closing the boyfriend loophole, and to thank uh, the other colleagues I have on this committee and other committees, uh, Senators Murphy, Senator Corn, and many others who are working to move forward on this framework. Um, Mr. Willingham, Mr. Schachter, your personal testimonies of loss and of tragedy uh, are what is propelling this body to act. More funerals than weddings to hear your stories of your father, your brother, your best friend being victims of gun violence is uh, just another part um, of the wave of uh, contacts, calls, emails, testimony that we've all gotten uh, in the months since the horrific attacks in Buffalo and Uvalde. Um, I've been flooded with messages from constituents begging for change and demanding Congress do something. I've heard from law enforcement, from pediatricians, from um, children, from educators, from parents who've been impacted by violence. Let me just briefly share two things I've heard. Dawn Hall, a uh, school social worker in the Brandywine School District, says she sees kids every day afraid to go out of their home or attend school because they fear if they go out, they won't return. Uh, Tracy Manza Murphy, known to me as the executive director of the Delaware Coalition Against Gun Violence, told me that communities as well as individuals experience trauma from gun violence and the invisible wounds on communities scar generations. Doctor, your testimony amplifies that same point. Uh, we can't allow this carnage to continue to traumatize children, families, whole communities, uh, whether it's daily gun violence in our streets, whether it's um, horrible losses through uh, suicide or it's mass shootings that seem to rivet the attention of the country. I am uh, glad to be working uh, with 20 colleagues on a framework and I think this package of reforms doesn't move every solution we might hope, but it makes progress on a number of solutions that many of my colleagues have worked on for years, and it will save lives. Um, I was uh, glad through my congressional delegation to deliver a $2 million congressionally directed spending investment in community violence intervention programs in Wilmington, Delaware, where I'm from, and excited to see the support for President Biden's request for millions more for similar community violence intervention programming. Uh, I've also been proud to work with Chairman Durbin and Senator Booker on the Preventing and Addressing Trauma with Health Services, or PATHS Act, to surge resources to mental health programs for communities experiencing um, trauma from gun violence. Let me ask two quick questions, if I might. Um, Mr. Willingham, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, mental health solutions to uh, prevent gun violence, but I'd also like to focus on the mental health needs of those who've been indirectly impacted, who are the family members or community members. Um, what kinds of services or programs do you think Congress should support to help children who've experienced gun violence um, live through and uh, move past their trauma? Thank you, Senator Coons, for the question. Um, and just thank you for just acknowledging that, you know, the secondhand trauma that family, friends, and community members face is definitely important and it often gets pushed aside and neglected. Um, I think programs as such, like I mentioned in my testimony, like the Chicago Youth Program, for example, uh, me and many other graduates have gone on and graduated from the program but gone on to do great things in life. Programs like that that ensure not only that young people have something to do in their spare time but also ensure that you have the resources and that you have the network. If you are unsure about things or you need certain things at home, if you need extra resources for school supplies, if you need extra resources for um, clothing, different things like that, because these are things that young that goes in a, goes in a young person's mind. If they are wearing shoes from Target and another student is wearing a shoes from Foot Locker, those type of things go into young people's minds every single day. I hear it. I work in a school. I'm not too far out of high school, so I know 
firsthand about how it feels. But programs as such, like the Chicago Youth Program definitely has made an impact on my life specifically. Um, being able to have not only just the physicians and different healthcare professionals to look up to, considering that's the career that I want to go into, but also having them as a resource to talk to about different situations in my neighborhood and having accessibility to social workers and mental health professionals that can guide and steer me in the direction to make sure that um, I'm staying on the right track. I, ho I hope that answers your question. Investing in both school-based and community-based yes, mental exactly. health resources is something we're looking to do. And Mr. Schachter, I appreciated hearing about some of the school safety initiatives um, that you were advocating for that I will consider more seriously. And Chief, if I might briefly, given the brevity of the time I have left, could you just speak briefly to how gun violence prevention solutions, allowing law enforcement to seek a crisis intervention order could be a critical part of community policing interventions to prevent further gun violence. So thank you for that uh, question, Senator Coons. Uh, quite frankly, I've been one to stand up and say quite often that the blue suit or the blue uniform or whatever color uniform an officer is wearing is not the right uniform to respond to a mental health crisis. That's why communities, um, churches, faith-based, you name it, we need those resources available to keep the law enforcement officers available and accessible for violent crime issues versus mental health issues. So the Major City Chiefs Association is definitely an advocate of creating those opportunities for those resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kuhn. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to you uh, for your leadership on this issue and to many of my Judiciary Committee colleagues and uh, on both sides of the aisle, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know there has been discussion about the need to intervene and take action when there are warning signs, and so often there are warning signs, the so-called red flags, the evidence of an emergency risk that justify a court order to separate a person from a gun when he says he's going to kill himself or others. And uh, I am very sympathetic to the Eagles Act in its objective of training school officials to identify and intervene and to other measures that uh, I want to say I think are important to keep in mind and perhaps support. But at the core of protecting people from those shooters who may kill or injure themselves or others is the idea that they have to be separated from the firearm. There has to be some kind of authorization, a court order, after due process, after evidence-based testimony. Uh, and that's why Florida's red flag law alone, which has been used more than 8,000 times, has been effective in saving lives, and why I believe so strongly that the proposal that Senator Graham and I have worked on uh, over the years, uh, and we've modified it for this proposal, really has to be integral to moving forward. Uh, just keep in mind, red flag orders can only be temporary at both the emergency stage and uh, after a hearing notice, an opportunity to be heard, they can only be brought by certain individuals, such as law enforcement. They can only be issued by judges who determine the need for them uh, based on evidence in court. But without this kind of court intervention, the identification is gonna fall short of stopping the killing. Um, so I am hopeful uh, that uh, we can move forward with this package. I'm very clear-eyed about the obstacles still to be overcome and the work ahead of us. Uh, we're on a very tight time schedule and I am hopeful that we can land a package that truly saves lives. It won't be everything we want or everything we need, 
but it will be a start. We can build on it and demand more. People should demand more than what is in this package. Let me, uh, and, and by the way, demanding more means self safe storage. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Chief Williams, uh, I have long been an advocate of Ethan's law, which would provide for safe storage, unfortunately is not in this package, but it is a proposal that can save thousands of lives. Ethan's law must be on our agenda. Would you agree? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Senator. Uh, we at the MCCA do agree that safe storage is definitely a component in making sure that there is responsible gun ownership, as well as keeping the guns not being accessible to young people and juveniles. And do you agree that a red flag or emergency risk protection order statute or crisis intervention that is ordered by a court is important in saving lives? So thank you for that question also, Senator. Yes, the MCCA, we do concur with the red flag laws as well. Um, Mr. Schachter, um, I appreciate your leadership on both the Eagles and the Luke and Alex Act. Do you view those as compatible with a red flag or emergency risk order statute? A hundred percent, Senator. The threat assessment and the Eagles Act is the first component of uh, getting all the stakeholders, to, stakeholders together to figure out what's going on with this individual and then to get them the help they need. The red flag law is one of the tools in their tool belt that they use. And so the threat assessment is done first to investigate, bring all those stakeholders together, to bring all the information together to connect the dots. And then if we need, then you have the red flag law to uh, remove that weapon from that dangerous individual. So they work hand in glove together, and they're very, very important that they are together. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the advocacy and the insights of everybody on this panel. I think we are in a very different political environment where people on both sides are heeding the American people's demand and plea, do something. And I think your point, Mr. Schachter, is very important for my colleagues to understand they can be for the Eagles Law and the Luke and Alex Law mm -hmm. and view it as mutually yeah. supportive. Together. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Leahy. Thank you, Chair. You know, I, I state the obvious, but I say it's been a particularly heavy month for our country. May 14th. Murder 10 in Buffalo, motivated by a racist conspiracy theory. Ten days later, mass shooting that claimed the lives of 19 fourth graders, two teachers in Uvalde. Just days after Uvalde, even more mass shootings, scenes of carnage, every corner of America. Our children and our grandchildren having their lives cut short by gun violence that's an unacceptable reality in our country. Firearms becoming the leading cause of death among children, the intolerable reality in our country, <clears throat> something other countries do not have to face. I think it's time that everybody acknowledge the reality and do something about it. Protecting the lives of our children and our grandchildren, that shouldn't be a matter for debate or disagreement. There is hope on the horizon. I'm glad to see agreement on a bipartisan package of bills that begin to address gun violence in this country. It's a good start. I wish it went further, but I know how difficult it was for them to get there. I am particularly encouraged the agreement includes key provisions for my bill, the Stop Illegal Trafficking in Firearms, which I've been working on for the past 10 years with Senator Durbin and Senator Collins. This bipartisan legislation will help combat straw purchasing, something that law enforcement all over the country tell me is important. Uh, but there, I know there's no sing, uh, single answer, but we've got to do better for our children. When I was a prosecutor, every time there was a shooting that resulted in a death, I went to the scene. 
whether it was three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon. I've never gotten those scenes out of my mind. I can recount every single one of them, every single second, every single thing I saw. And that was a tiny fraction of what we're seeing today. So Chief Williams, thank you for your testimony on behalf of the Major Cities Chief Association. They uh, want us to update the law. They want us to ensure federal prosecutors can hold straw purchases accountable. I hear that from the police in my state. What what kind of, tell us about the dangers, the, the real dangers these straw purchases create. So thank you for that question, Senator. At the end of the day, as I previously mentioned, I have had nine officers shot in six months. Mm -hmm. These individuals that are shooting my officers are not legally purchasing firearms. They are purchasing them illegally whether it be straw purchases, ghost guns, you name it, it's creating a dynamic that's not just impacting the youth and the young people in our community, it's impacting law enforcement. And so if I may, you mentioned the trauma that, that you are recalling as you go to those scenes. Imagine being a police officer having to go through that instance and those scenes involving yourself and or fellow officers, uh, as well as victims of domestic violence and other victims of gun violence. So um, it is a problem, it's something that needs to be addressed and the MCCA strongly advocates for strong prosecution in those cases as well. Thank you, sir. And, and are you finding that uh, there are, are drug gangs that use these straw purchases? So thank you for that question too, Senator. Um, as you previously mentioned about violence, it's a multitude and multifaceted. Yes, gangs, yes, drugs, yes, trying to you know, com complete a transaction is definitely happening in our communities. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Willingham, I watched your testimony earlier, and I was struck by your testimony about attending more funerals than weddings as a young person in Chicago. Your fear of being shot if you stayed close to home. I understand you're purchasing, uh, uh, per pursuing a future as a physician. My wife is a medical surgical nurse, and I have a great deal of appreciation for those who seek uh, jobs in the, in the medical field, doctor, I include you. What's the main message you want to leave with us? If there's one thing you want every member of Congress to hear, what do you hope your life story tells us? And, and just thank you, Senator, for the question. And just so I'm um, have a clear understanding in terms of my life story or in terms of the message that I want to leave in the message you want to leave? Um, well, if, if, if I can just start off by saying it, as Chief Williams mentioned, gun violence and violence itself is a multifaceted issue. And there are multiple ways to tackle it, multiple avenues that we can um, that we can take and mental health is definitely a big concern and has been, um, especially through the pandemic. However, I don't think that mental health, it, it's a problem, but I don't think the, it's the, the, the core problem of the problem that's what, you know, why gun violence is so prevalent. Um, the problem is, um, committee members, is that the mental health professionals that are present and communities that are suffering from gun violence all look like you. They don't look like me. They don't look like other people of color that have been through a mental health trauma. They look like you, you guys that are esteemed, um, coming with affluent backgrounds. They don't look like me, people who can attest, secondhand attest, and have faced that sort of trauma. So in addition to legislation re revolving around gun control, we need more mental health professionals, not just mental health professionals, but mental health professionals that, one, looks like the people that they're serving. Because how does it look that a person that doesn't look like me can come and tell me something about gun violence and you've never experienced it? You don't know the first thing about gun violence, and you don't know the first thing of how it feels to be affected by it. And you're not living in the community. You have never dealt with it. 
So that's the message that I want to leave off on today, Senator. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Chair. I understand Senator Ossoff has an agreement to go next with Senator Padilla and Senator Cruz. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Senators Padilla and Cruz, uh, for uh, allowing that. I reflecting on and preparing for this hearing, and I thank our panelists for your testimony. Um, my wife and I welcomed a baby daughter into the world in December, uh, so she's just passed her sixth month. Um, my appreciation for the extraordinary, heart-wrenching, unimaginable pain of those who lose their children has been magnified and deeply affected by the experience of parenthood. And so whether it's the parents of those killed in Texas or the parents of the children taken from us, taken from all of us, all of their potential extinguished, their lives of limitless possibility cut short, the pain of parents every day losing children to gun violence. Now the number one cause of death for American children, babies, it's profound. I thank you all for being here. I'm gonna just take my remaining time and read into the record some statements of experience by doctors in the state of Georgia who have treated babies and children who are victims of gun violence. This submitted by Dr. Sally Goza of Fayetteville, general pediatrician. The mom loaded her three children in the car to go to the dentist one morning. On the way, she heard a pop, looked in the rearview mirror, and saw her three-year-old slumped over with a gun in her hand. She had found a gun left by her dad's friend under the seat and shot herself in the head. These submitted by Dr. Nabia Mahmoud, pediatric critical care, Atlanta, Georgia. Quote, I lost a sweet six-year-old one day. She and her younger brother were waiting in the car as their mother worked under the hood, trying to figure out why the car wouldn't start. As curious children do, the four-year-old boy got bored and jumped out of his car seat. He found a loaded handgun in the glove box and unwittingly fired it, hitting his sister directly through the right eye. I declared her brain dead just a few days after she arrived at the pediatric ICU while the family still reeled from the loss of their child and their worry over the effect this tragedy would have on her brother. She continues, one night I was alerted to a trauma being flown in. A seven-year-old boy had been shot while playing in his front yard. He was simply too sick to survive. His heart had stopped multiple times and the lack of oxygen irreparably damaged his organs. When his heart finally stopped for the last time, his mother screamed and begged me to bring him back. The whole team cried as we told her there was nothing more we could do. She continues. I remember the nine month old baby who underwent hand and brain surgery in the same night. She was riding in a car and her mother when their car was sprayed with bullets. She had her tiny hand in the air. The bullet went through her hand and into her head. She probably saved her own life. The bullet's trajectory went through her brain, but missed the most important structures. She survived, but with significant neurologic deficits. I really, Mr. Chairman, commend the senators leading these bipartisan efforts. I pray that we will get a result that saves the lives of babies and children in this country. Thank you all for being with us, and I yield. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you to each of the witnesses for being here today. All of us are horrified at the mass murders we see unfolding across our country. Mass murders in schools, mass murders in churches, mass murders in large cities across our country day after day and week after week. And I believe everyone on this committee wants to prevent those murders. In Texas, we've seen these horrific acts of evil repeatedly. I was in Uvalde the day after the shooting. I've seen the agony of the parents, of the teachers, of the school officials, of the law enforcement, of the grandparents of the entire community torn to pieces. I was in Santa Fe within about an hour of that horrific mass murder. I was in Sutherland Springs the day after that horrific shooting. I stood in that beautiful sanctuary and saw the chaos, saw the pews thrown to the side, saw the blood still pooled where innocent people had been murdered, innocent people down to an 18-month-old toddler shot and killed. I saw shattered cell phones covered in blood. I was in El Paso. I was in Midland, Odessa. I was in D Dallas. Over and over again, we have seen these horrific crimes. And whenever they happen, there is a call that predictably comes out. A call of do something. Now listen, I agree with that call. I agree we need to do something. But I also believe we need to do something that actually will work, that will stop the next mass murder, that will keep people safe. I don't want to have to see another parent like Mr. Schachter who lost his son. The pain and agony you've experienced and far too many others have experienced, it is the worst nightmare for any parent. If we want to stop these murders, we know the approach that actually works. The approach that actually works is twofold. Number one, focus on the bad guys. Focus on the criminals. Focus on the felons and fugitives and those with serious mental illness that try to illegally buy firearms. Prosecute them and put them in jail. Get them off the streets. It also means that when people carry out crimes with firearms, prosecute them and lock them up. Make it a priority. You bring a gun to a crime and you are doing hard time. Get the trigger pullers off the streets. And then secondly, enhancing safety and security of vulnerable targets and especially schools, since Columbine, one after another dark, twisted monster has decided the way he can achieve what he thinks is immortality is go and murder little children. Now, I will note that I make it a policy never to say the names of any of these shooters, and I would encourage every member of this committee and every member of the press, these evil bastards deserve to be forgotten forever. But we can do a lot more to make our schools safer. Mr. Schachter, thank you for your efforts pushing common sense legislation to make schools safer. I think the legislation you're fighting for makes a lot of sense. Repeatedly, I've introduced legislation to go after the criminals, to go after the felons and fugitives and those with serious mental illness, to prosecute them when they illegally buy firearms, to get them off the street, to prosecute the gun criminals, and to provide resources to schools to make schools safer, 
to install safety equipment in schools. You and I sat down, Mr. Schachter, in my office, and we talked about how frustrating, how maddening it is that at schools we keep seeing the same pattern over and over again. The monster in Parkland went through an unlocked back door. The monster in Santa Fe went through an unlocked back door. The monster in Uvalde went through an open back door. We keep having the same vulnerabilities and not fixing them. Repeatedly, I've introduced legislation to provide funding to put security equipment on campus, and the most important security tool we can have is armed law enforcement on campus. In Uvalde, if that door had been locked and shut, if there had been a single entrance like we have at a bank, like we have at a federal building, and if there had been armed police officers at that single entrance, when that monster arrived, those police officers could have stopped him, could have shot him, could have killed him before he murdered 19 students and two teachers. I hope and pray that finally this time we won't see partisan posturing. We won't see politicians trying to disarm law-abiding citizens, but we'll come together and say, let's focus on what works, let's focus on the bad guys, and let's make our schools safer. Thank you. Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if I observe accurately, I may be the last uh, senator to ask some questions, and I may ask for an indulgence of an extra minute or two uh, to uh, not just questions, but begin by uh, addressing Mr. Willingham. I see you. I hear you. I feel you. I appreciate an observation commentary you made just a few minutes ago about uh, the senators up here on the dais, and by and large, I agree. I think uh, this committee has done a tremendous amount of work in diversifying the federal judiciary uh, to uh, confirm nominees to the federal bench that are much more diverse than has been in the case in the past, uh, to bring important perspectives, not just from a gender, ethnic perspective, but professional experience and life experience, and uh, many of us are actively working to over time further and better diversify the United States Senate and Congress as a whole to bring more perspectives and life experience because I share yours. Uh, when I get home, I invite you to Google uh, Pacoima, California, 1980s, because that's where I grew up. If you really want me to describe it, I, uh, years ago there was this movie, Boys in the Hood, you might have heard about it. More recently, straight out of Compton. I didn't grow up in Compton. But just watch those opening scenes and you get a flavor for where and how I grew up. Just so you know, that perspective is present up here uh, on the dais. Uh, Mr. Chair, as you know, because uh, I talk about it often, I'm not just here as a United States Senator. I'm here as a father of three school-aged children. Uh, and so uh, my heart remains broken uh, for the families and the friends of the victims in Uvalde, Texas. And as we continue to learn more about how law enforcement responded to the active shooter and more about the school security apparatus, uh, there's a lot to unpack there still, but I, I, we cannot let that distract from the underlying issues of unfettered access to guns. So that's why I too am encouraged by the progress that seems to be being made on a bipartisan basis here in the Senate and look forward to supporting the legislative framework that was announced this last weekend that will, among other things, close the boyfriend loophole that Senator Klobuchar talked about, invest significantly in mental health. And I have a question uh, on that here in a minute. Would also enhance background checks for buyers under the age of 21, among other things. Senator Murphy on our side of the aisle has done a tremendous job and I wanna give credit to Senator Cornyn who spoke earlier for leading the Republican side of these negotiations because we do owe it, not just to the community of Uvalde and the families there, but for the communities across the country who have for too long been impacted by senseless gun violence. We owe it to them to take action. And what I am confident we will achieve here in the days and couple weeks ahead will still leave us with more work to do. It will still leave us with more work to do. My first question uh, is in regards to access to guns. So over the years, we've seen a growing threat posed by at-home kits used by 
many to build untraceable guns. So we're talking a lot about retailers and how old you have to be, background checks, et cetera. But ghost guns are a growing challenge. Less than one week after the tragedy in Uvalde, a 16-year-old boy was arrested in Berkeley, California, my home state, following reports that he was attempting to recruit students to attack a local high school. Upon searching his home, officers found parts to build rifles. They found explosives and various knives, all of which he had legally attained. Shortly thereafter, officers also arrested a 17-year-old boy in Menifee County for threatening to shoot up a school and being in possession of a ghost gun. My question, Chief Williams, I see you nodding, is for you. In your written testimony, you state that Congress must ensure that law enforcement has the tools and authorities it needs to mitigate the threat posed by privately manufactured firearms. Besides establishing a penalty for possessing a ghost gun, what else would you urge Congress to do? Senator, thank you for that question. It's actually a, a very good, good question. Um, we have a strong partnership with the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, or the ATF. Local and law enforcement, because of our resources that we don't have, we have to engage more with the ATF. So Marvin Richardson, if I may put that on the record, has been an amazing lead in that cause. What I would advocate in answering your question is creating dynamics where we are able to, as law enforcement, trace those ghost guns and trace those parts that go to make the ghost guns. And once that tracing happens, be able to link that person and strongly prosecute them. So thank you. And um, we may have some uh, follow-up uh, on that topic, but I do want to just add for the record that California is one of the states that does have an assault weapons ban uh, that is seeking to raise the age of uh, being able to purchase a firearm from 18 to 21 and other protections. And as a result, uh, there's 8.5 gun deaths per 100,000 population in the state of California, 38% less than the national average, which is 13.7, and approximately 40% less than it is in Texas, where it's 14.2. So yes, smart gun safety laws do work, but they're not as effective as they can be when it's only state by state. We need federal protections. And by the way, Californians are 25% less likely to die in mass shootings. Now, the other uh, issue I wanted to raise, Mr. Chair, is uh, in regards to mental health. Uh, now, I have to confess, when I heard the, the framework that was announced last weekend without an assault weapons ban, without a ban on large capacity magazines, and such an emphasis on mental health, I paused initially in a time when we're statistically averaging over one mass shooting a day. More mass shootings in America this year than days on the calendar. We have to pause and consider the trauma-inducing effects that these weapons and the violence that they create have on our children and on our communities, especially following school shootings. Uh, Dr. Silagi, your organization joined others in declaring a national state of emergency in children's mental health last year. And among the list of recommendations you all released is a call to increase federal funding so that we're better able to screen, diagnose, and treat mental health needs of children. Can you discuss specifically how this would benefit children who have been exposed to gun violence? Thank you very much for that question, Senator Padilla. Um, Yes, we did declare a national health emergency in children's mental health, and it was jointly declared by us, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association, because mental health problems are at epidemic proportions among our youth, and they've only been getting worse. Um, I think that um, increased funding so that um, we can um, diversify our workforce, as Mr. Willingham noted, um, train and educate the current workforce that we do have to do this work a little bit differently in a trauma-informed way, in a way that is culturally humble, um, so that we can um, use the tools that are out there. There are evidence-based tools for screening and assessment, for diagnosis, um, evidence-based interventions for treatment, um, for families that we do identify or children we do identify who are struggling and who have difficulties. 
I would also just like to point out that those with mental health problems are far more likely to be victims of violence than to perpetrate violence. And that the, the um, a forensic analysis done in, in 2019, looking back at all the mass shootings in America back to 1966, found that 100% of those who perpetrated mass shootings in schools all had significant trauma histories. They grew up in violent homes, they were abused and neglected, they were bullied, and they had high levels of community violence um, or some combination of those factors. So I think having the right tools will help us. We also do need more funding for community-based health centers, as was noted today, um, school-based mental health, and um, integrated care in our primary care settings. I think there are a lot of things we can do. I think everybody in this room knows that a complex problem doesn't have a simple solution. And I think all the multi-pronged efforts around um, improved mental health services, building safe schools that are physically safe and emotionally safe, um, sensible gun laws, and safe gun storage are all components yeah. of that complex. So my, my wife, Anna, is a mental health advocate, so she's educated me well, and I thank you for uh, your comments. Mr. Chair, I'll just end with this. I mentioned that when I first heard the framework, I had the pause of such a focus on mental health, which look, it was a crisis before the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been made you know, much more acute, uh, particularly among, for young people. Uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, and what uh, more than convinced me to support the framework was an interview I saw just a few days ago, one of the teachers that survived in Uvalde. And for the, for the life of me, his name is escaping me at this moment. But when I saw him on national news apologizing to the parents of the community in Uvalde to please forgive him, he did everything that he could, reminded me that when, after a mass shooting for years and years and years, such a focus on mental health is used to distract from the gun safety side of the conversation. Mental health, could we have prevented this? Could we have identified a troubled young person? I get it, that's part of a conversation that alone isn't the solution, but I saw this teacher pouring his heart out and I said, the parents of the children who died are gonna need help. The children who survived are going to need help. The teachers who survived are going to need help. The whole community is going to need ongoing help. There, we're, we need as many resources invested in all areas of mental health that you described and more. And uh, we hope we're on the verge of uh, doing exactly that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Uh, this uh, hearing is coming to a close, and I want to say that there's a request for statements to be entered in the record. I have a long list, uh, and without objection, they will be entered. I do want to note among those are hundreds of pediatricians, doctor, who are writing this committee pleading with us. These are the men and women who literally uh, are responsible for the lives of these children and who are called on in the most horrific circumstances to do their best to save their lives. What a grim reminder of the importance of this hearing and the grim reality of violence, gun violence on our children across America. Uh, when we're talking about the leading cause of death of American kids, we cannot ignore the fact it's guns. And uh, that is a reality which we acknowledge today. Hearing record is going to remain open for a week. There may be questions sent your way, which I hope you'll respond to in a timely fashion. Thanks to all of our witnesses again for coming. The hearing is adjourned.